So again, welcome uh, to Preservation and Action Advocacy in Asian um, and Pacific Islander American Communities. And my name is Michelle Magalong, and I am president of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation, as well as presidential uh, postdoctoral fellow um, at the University of Maryland's uh, Historic Preservation Program. Let me know. And so uh, before we begin, and I before I introduce um, our speakers today, um, I just want to say happy November. Uh, uh, yesterday, we kicked off both what is Native American Heritage Month and Sick Awareness and Appreciation Month. So, um, you know, feel free to um, join us in the chat um, and share with us where you may um, be joining in from. Um, including, you know, if you want to, an acknowledgement of what ancestral indigenous lands you may be um, on today. I am here in Washington, D.C., um, the ancestral and unceded lands of the Piscataway people. And so um, I am thrilled to have folks, these speak speakers, join me today. Some background about um, API HIP and these sessions um, that you've been on today uh, actually. Uh, over a decade ago, back in 2007, API HIP was um, created um, during um, the National Trust Conference um, around this time. Um, and it was uh, based on one Japanese American, two folks from Guam and a, and a handful of others who saw uh, that there was um, very few um, faces that you like you see on um, today's Zoom that looked like us, um, but those folks, um, knew that, that there was a lot of work happening across the country, but we weren't in the larger historic preservation field. And that is what created um, what we now know as API HIP. Um, and so um, you'll be hearing from some folks um, who are partners with API HIP. Um, also, I, you know, as president, um, and I have a board member here today who is Tej Paul Singh Baniwal, and you'll hear from him um, from UC Riverside. He's a doctoral student there and also co-founder of the Sick American History Project. Um, we had lined up uh, Joe Kinata from Guam Preservation Trust, but uh, a last minute um, issue came up and he's unable to join us, but you can see the work he's doing um, and with folks from Guam um, on a session that's scheduled for um, this Friday at 3 p uh, 3.15 Eastern. Um, so Joe sends his regards um, and he hopes you to see you guys at his session on Friday. We also have Mia Russell, who is with the Japanese American Confinement Sites Consortium and the Japanese American National Museum. Dan Sakura, who is with Co uh, Sakura Conservation Strategies. And we have um, Ed Teporn from Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. So you'll be hearing um, from each of them. and. Um, as you had heard throughout today's sessions, today's election day, and um, today I wanted to invite these folks, I invited our speakers in thinking about what does advocacy look like for, um, for us in doing preservation work in, within Asian and Pacific Islander American communities. And so I gave folks, uh, our speakers homework of uh, what does it look like um, you convert those policy uh, uh, folders that the one pagers you leave um, when you visit a member, uh, you know, an elected official um, into a Zoom format. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what does it mean to, to pitch your story, pitch your project um, and call for action in less than five minutes? So this is gonna be kind of a quick fire of presentations. Um, and so I will turn this over to, to Tej Paul to kick it off. Thank you, Michelle. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name and good morning and good night, I guess, you know, depending on where you're joining us from. Everybody, my name is Tejpa Singh Benua. I am a PhD candidate at UC Riverside focusing on Sikh American history, hence the reason why I launched the Sikh American History Project. So what exactly is the Sikh American History Project? Plain and simple, it's a project dedicated to unearthing preserving and promoting the history of Sikhs in the United States. And we see these as three different stages of highlighting Sikh American history. So with, with several preservation organizations and historical societies already out there looking to preserve history and those that aim to promote diversity and inclusion, why did I feel the need to start the Sikh American History Project? 
Well, to answer that, I pose this question to everybody listening. When talking about American history or when you learned about American history, do these four years ring a bell? 1899, 1912, 1957, and 2012. Now I'm not asking if these years were highlighted or stressed because that's extremely wishful thinking, but simply asking if these years were even worth a mention. Um, it would be great to get a poll, um, you know, because we're familiar with 1496, 1776, 1865, 2001. Those years are engraved in our minds and have been since elementary school. Other years that aren't as common, but still um, mentioned quite a bit, such as 1882 and 1942 when talking about Asian American history. But when we think about American history or when we're talking about American history, do we know what happened in these four years? You know, in 1899, the San Francisco Chronicle reported that the first sick Americans were allowed to land. Um, and it was a form of gatekeeping by white immigration office officials who were enforcing laws by white politicians. And in 1912, um, you know, we get the first sick American institution in the United States, the first sick place of worship in Stockton. In 1957, we get the first Asian American member of Congress in the Leipzig Sound. And in 2012, you know, folks say that um, there was an article that said that, you know, it takes a mask or a tragedy for someone to be accepted as American. So in 2012, there was not only the centennial celebration of Stockton Gurdwara, but it was also the mass shooting at Oak Creek in which seven individuals um, were murdered by white supremacists. So what's the solution? So Sick American History Project, beyond just presenting at conferences and, um, you know, we're conducting archival research and oral histories with over 400 or, um, newspaper articles and 30 hours of oral history research already done, um, working to designate Sikh American sites as historic landmarks at the local, state, and federal level, building a Sikh American archive and museum, um, hoping to recreate history and bringing missing uh, pieces back to life um, through 3D imaging and work on short videos and films about Sikh American history. And these are all current projects or those that are um, you know, in R&D stages right now. So, um, you know, next is ways that the public can help. So there are a lot of things that are happening in the back end. So we'll be officially launching more projects so you can help or you can get involved by signing up for our mailing list. You can visit our website. It's www.sickamericanhistory.org and I'll throw it in the chat as well. Um, oh, someone already did. Thank you, Michelle. Um, <laughs> And, for, and at the bottom of that, you'll see um, a chance to sign up for our mailing list and also follow us on our social media, which I'll share at the end of this presentation. And then uh, other ways you can get involved. And you know, the final way is to donate. Um, we do have a donation link set up officially and it's a tax deductible do donation for those who, oh, sorry. I threw that in the um, chat as well. Um, we have a lot of exciting products underway and we'll slowly be launching them again so to learn more and get involved and updates of our project, um, just follow us on social media. Here are ways you can follow us on social media. And to sign up for our newsletter, you can visit our website at the very bottom um, of the first page. And if you, know, you want to get in touch with me personally, you have my email right there. And hopefully um, I saved a little bit of time at the end, um, Michelle, for one quick last thing. And um, you know, I'm not sure if there has been a study on this or not, but it would be very interesting to see the numbers behind all the funding that's distributed. That's the true showing of what histories really matter. Um, if the funding is going to majority white preservationists for white historic sites, do not tell me that you truly value diversity. But then the typical response we hear is, oh, we have special funding or special um, grants for marginalized, underrepresented, and underserved communities. So please apply for it. Well, that's lovely, but you know, we also must acknowledge that folks like me didn't grow up knowing that grants were available. Now that I know they're available, I wasn't sure how to apply for them. But when I learned that, then I'm so caught up with all the other requests to volunteer my time and expertise to educate people about my community's history, for free, that is. And furthermore, these specific grants are just a small pocket of funding that so many amazing orgs that so many amazing orgs um, and individuals and products by diverse communities are all fighting for the small piece of pie, um, literally pitting marginalized communities against one another. I know a lot of amazing individuals, organizations, and projects that deserve the white people funding, but there's so many loopholes, bureaucratic drama, or politics that a lot of marginalized communities and underrepresented communities don't really have time for. We're busy trying to preserve and save our community's history. So for those who do have that time for, you know, 
the loopholes, the drama, bureaucratic drama and the politics, it's a luxury. So if you truly value diversity and want to fund these projects, have a conversation with them. Don't just say apply here or join this committee. A lot of orgs and people are qualified for these grants, but there's some hurdle. So just talk to them and see how you can help ensure they receive the funding and help that they need to preserve their histories. Truly elevate these voices. Thank you. Hopefully I made the five minute limit. Thanks, Tej Paul. Wonderful and uh, great responses on um, on the chat. So be sure to see what everyone has been sharing. Um, I'm gonna go next and talk about uh, a project that I've been um, a part of here in Washington DC that is called AAPI in DC here in plain sight. Um, it is a Asian American historic context study for uh, Washington DC. Uh, that was funded, um, it's part of, or it was funded uh, through the National Park Service Underrepresented Communities um, Grant um, and through DC Preservation League and uh, the DC Preservation um, um, Agency here. And so uh, it launched right before COVID and um, as a team we had hoped to do uh, workshops um, in person to invite the community to, um, to share their um, places of significance here in the district. But as you know, with COVID, we, uh, us like many other groups had to switch it up and do um, virtual programming and also delay our timing um, with a lot of our community engagement and archival research since we couldn't even go to, you know, the National Archives or, or any of the local uh, collections um, for a long time. Um, and so this is, a uh, just a snippet of a postcard that we have created. Um, and the, the issue that on hand um, for uh, what brought forward AAPI um, in DC is the need to identify, document, and preserve Asian American history here in the district. Um, as much as you see in this photo, the DC Chinatown gate has been something um, that people often, um, uh, it's something that is known but what people don't know are the people, uh, you know, what the, what the general public doesn't know are the people. And so if you're wondering why are they playing that volleyball uh, in front of the uh, DC Chinatown gate, it's because uh, nine man volleyball has been going on in Chinese American communities for decades. It's, it's a highly competitive tournament that travels across the United States. Um, and uh, for those who grew up from the 50s and 60s, um, 70s, uh, they didn't have uh, public parks or public spaces to um, to do uh, nine bat, nine and volleyball or other um, you know forms of recreation. Instead, they were in the alleys of DC Chinatown. Uh, DC Chinatown has been consistently threatened by um, issues of displacement and demolition. The first Chinatown is uh, now where the Federal Circle is. Um, the current Chinatown has become what people now refer to as not Chinatown, but China Block, because it has uh, shrunk in size. We have the Capital One Arena where NHL and NBA ga uh, games are played, and as, as well as the Convention Center. So imagine those places if you come to DC, that used to be Chinatown. You also see um, there are um, in language markers signage um, in Chinatown for Chipotle and Urban Outfitters and McDonald's. There are very few Chinese American owned and operated businesses or Asian American in DC and across um, the district. And um, furthermore, there are very few landmark designations um, across the district that are associated with Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And so the historic context statement was interesting as a, you know, it's a challenge. Right, um, not much published, but a lot known by word of mouth and by community knowledge. And so our work has been on how do you look at community engagement um, and archival research, both in person and now in this virtual world, um, you know, and, and addressing issues that are not of just historical significance, but also not only with COVID, but you know. Um, we felt like in the, in the last year, you know, violence against Asian Americans, including here in DC was heavily felt and tying those historical connections of violence and discrimination um, of central, you know, over, over the past uh, hundred years to what's being felt now. And so we created this historic context statement um, study. Uh, this is here a flyer 
um, to do for a research survey. And you see some images that people have started to share with us, uh, not only in Chinatown, but let's see, Lee's uh, Laundry and Dry Cleaner in Adams Morgan, uh, the Korean Legation Building, um, you know, even issues of diplomacy um, and, 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 and government relations. And also, you know, from even what's the traditional Chinese restaurants that you see throughout the district. Um, and here you could see uh, how people have supported our, the work that we do. Uh, contribute to the project. As you see, there was a survey. So we're asking folks to help us uh, find um, archival materials um, of our histories here in DC. Um, we also are looking at how can you support it in a larger scale, support the National uh, Park Service Underrepresented Communities Grant Program. Every year it goes up for approvals um, for the appropriations. And, you know, um, what has been it was established for, I think, over $3 million. And every year it's only appropriated um, for at most 750,000. So uh, we, every year API HIP um, and other organizations fight for full um, appropriation, uh, not just partial. And then also um, ways, other ways you can support is to support preservation funding that um, is more inclusive and expansive as Tejwald noted um, on how we do historic preservation and conservation uh, work in our community, in AAPI communities. And then thanks to our supporters, as I mentioned, the National Park Service, DC Preservation League 1882, who is um, the fiscal sponsor for this. We have a full team. You can visit uh, the website um, here. Um, and you know we have member uh, partners like the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. And I am thankful for my graduate students who have been assisting um, from the University of Maryland's Historic Preservation Program. And so you can learn more by uh, you can hover over this QR code, but I can also drop the link later on um, about this project. Um, and so it'll take you straight to the form um, for the historic resources list. And then that was a not you aren't supposed to see that one yet, but <laughs> um, and and that's just a quick snippet of AAPI in DC, the project we're doing here in Washington DC. And I would like to uh, hand it off to Mia now. Thank you, Michelle. I will share my screen now. Um, and thanks to all the presenters today and all the great work that they're doing. Um, hopefully you can all see my slide now. Um, I am Mia Russell. I manage the Japanese American Confinement Sites Consortium, which is a national network of organizations working to preserve sites and history related to the Japanese American incarceration experience during World War II. And today I'm going to share some information about the Japanese American Confinement Education Act. So first I'll share information about the existing Japanese American Confinement Sites Grant Program. This program was established by Congress in 2006 to support the preservation and interpretation of World War II Japanese American confinement sites. The program is a two to one matching grant program administered by the National Park Service. Since the first year of funded projects in 2009, over $32.8 million in funding has gone to 247 projects in 22 states and Washington, DC. And as Michelle mentioned with the other grant project, this is something, grant program, sorry, we do have to um, make sure that this stays on the books every single year, but even more so, the program itself is at risk currently. Um, I just wanted to provide a quick list of some of the types of projects that have been made possible by this program. Um, this includes historic reconstruction, exhibitions, documentaries, educational curricula, oral histories, primary resource digitization and access, and more. This is in no way exhaustive, but I hope it can begin to give you an idea of really the complete transformation of the landscape of the preservation and public education related to the Japanese American World War II experience. Um, I think I can safely say that the impact on public awareness and the state of these historic sites themselves um, would have been unimaginable at the time that the project was conceived a short 15 years ago, um, but that's the exact intent behind that program. So the issue today is this program was originally funded with $38 million. Um, the original funding is set to be exhausted at the end of 2022. And as it stands, the entire program itself is set to sunset at that time, according to the original legislation. Um, 
Another shortcoming of the program that I just wanted to touch on is that especially early on, it could result in competition between community organizations that obviously have very related um, missions, and it could also sometimes result in a duplication of efforts. Um, I should note that the JACS consortium is working to prevent this issue moving forward, and the consortium itself is actually the result of two JACS grants that were awarded that enabled us to hold all camp summits between organizations and organize a framework for moving forward in a way that could enhance collaboration between community organizations, um, which allows us to increase the overall impact of our individual and collective efforts. So though the Japanese American Confinement Sites Grant Program is currently endangered, our solution today is the Japanese American Confinement Education Act, which is a bipartisan effort organizing, originating with representatives Doris Matsui and Rob Bishop and Senator Brian Schatz in the 116th Congress. And this would permanently reauthorize the JAX Grant Program within the National Park Service, remove that sunset and authorize another $38 million in new funding and establish a new educational program modeled after the recently passed Holocaust Never Again Education Act. This would authorize an additional $10 million over five years to specifically go towards research, education, and the distribution of educational materials to promote a better understanding of the causes of the incarceration. So the intent for this aspect of the program is to be collaborative in nature, to have a national impact, rather than that piecemeal competitive um, impact of the Jack Scrap program as it exists today. Whoops. So we did have a hearing in the House Natural Resources Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands back in May. Um, we are still looking for additional sign-ons in both the House and Senate, especially from Re Republicans as we move forward in full committee and in the Senate. Um, and we're especially looking, of course, at those states that do have Japanese American confinement sites and related um, populations within those states. Um, so Michelle, if you could drop those congress.gov links. In the House, we have 65 co-sponsors for HR 1931. That includes 56 Democrats and nine Republicans. And in the Senate, for Senate Bill 988, we have eight Democratic co-sponsors. Um, we are looking for more co-sponsors, especially in the Senate. Um, so if you would be willing to reach out to your members of Congress, please get in touch with me for more information um, and our advocacy toolkit. And I'm happy to support you in aiming any material specifically towards your organization or your member of Congress. So you can find me at mia at jaxi.org or www.jaxi.org and on Twitter and Facebook at, at Jax Consortium. We are continuing to post updates online at jaxi.org slash Jace Act. Um, but I will stop there for now and save time for questions. So thank you. Thanks, Mia. And next we have Dan. Great. Michelle, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Dan Sakura. I'm the principal at Sakura Conservation Strategies. I'm located in the ancestral homeland of the Piscataway and Anacostan people. And I'm here to talk about Minidoka National Historic Site, a unit of national park system located on the ancestral homeland of the Shoshone Bannock tribes in South Central Idaho. We were recently learned about a proposed massive wind project within two miles of Minidoka known as the Lava Ridge Wind Project. So just a little bit about my family background, immediately after Pearl Harbor, uh, my dad and his family was ordered to evacuate or relocate from their homes uh, by force in Western Washington. They were sent to the Puyallup Fairgrounds and they could only bring what they could carry. Here's a map showing the, how the government created an exclusion zone in Western Washington and Oregon and directed um, about 13,000 Japanese Americans from these states to uh, the Minidoka Relocation Center, which was located just north of Twin Falls, Idaho. Here's a picture of uh, three generations of my family uh, at Minidoka, my great grandmother, my grandparents, my dad, my uncles, and uh, they're dressed up because on that day, uh, my grandfather and three of his brothers uh, joined the US military. Minidoka was one of the highest, some of the highest rates of military service of, of any of the camps. 
So uh, during the war, the Minidoka Relocation Center was home to over 13,000 Japanese Americans. They were held behind barbed wire uh, with guard towers. The conditions in camp were very difficult. Almost 200 people died in camp, uh, mostly young um, infants and elderly people. Um, almost 1,000 people joined Minidoka, joined the military out of camp and 73 paid the ultimate price with their lives um, fighting overseas. You can see from these pictures how flat the terrain is and uh, the water tower, how visible it is on the horizon. So this is a historic map of the camp. You can see the squares, which were the barracks blocks, um, which were built to house uh, imprisoned Japanese Americans. It was self-sufficient. They had um, farm fields nearby. Today, the National Park Service currently manages a portion of the site as the Minidoka National Historic Site. They recently opened up a brand new park visitor center, and they also um, preserve the camp entrance, which is located on the left side there. And that sort of squiggly property is a, a part of the park that the, that the LS Power, a New York private, invest, private equity company, tried to build a 500 kilovolt power line over the park in 2009, but fortunately, uh, the Park Service was able to, to beat that ba back. Today, the National Park serves as a site for learning and healing. Um, because of its remote location, it provides a, an immersive experience for park visitors. It provides views of open mountains and distant uh, plains. And most importantly, it gives visitors a chance to, to understand what it must have been like uh, to be held behind barbed wire because of your race for over three years. It's also a site for healing. Um, it's where Japanese Americans, uh, Minidoka survivors and descendants come together every year. This is pre-COVID, uh, a reconstructed honor roll at the entrance of the park. And it shows how powerful this site is for uh, the Japanese American community and how we've overcome really difficult challenges and um, including the, the pain of losing communities and homes and farms and property during the incarceration. Unfortunately, though, we learned in August uh, 2021, just as here of a proposal from the Biden administration announced by Secretary Holland to build a 1000 megawatt wind project, the Lava Ridge wind project uh, just north of Minidoka. Uh, we are encouraged that secretary is committed to engage uh, with communities to ensure that these projects are done thoughtfully. Um, and we're hopeful that the department will, will continue with that commitment, will follow the secretary's commitment. So just to orient folks, here's a map of Southern Idaho. You can see uh, Boise to the left there in the west, Craters of the Moon National Monument, Twin Falls, and the Lava Ridge project area is, is very large. It's so large that Minidoka doesn't even show up on the, the map at that scale. So LS Power, um, based out of New York, wants to build wind turbines as tall as 740 feet. Uh, you can see how tall these towers are in relation to the Washington Monument and the Seattle Space Needle. The turbine blades exceed the wingspan of a Boeing 747, and the towers are as high as equivalent of a 74-story building. Um, just also to give you a sense, the Minidoka guard tower is about 26 feet tall, and they'd be equivalent to 28 guard towers stacked end to end. So this is a map showing this massive wind project, uh, 400 towers, 80% would be within the viewshed of Minidoka. Um, the towers would form a visual wall that would blot out almost a third of the park's viewshed with spinning turbines and flashing lights. The BLM is studying 14, putting 14 towers on the historic footprint of Minidoka, and the closest tower would be located within two miles and clearly visible from the Park Visitor Center. So in terms of the process, uh, the, the BLM is currently in NEPA doing a, developing an environmental impact statement. The scoping period has closed and they're working to prepare a draft EIS. Concurrent with that, the BLM is working to comply with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, and there are monthly meetings uh, with stakeholders on that. In terms of the partners, the Japanese American Community, uh, Japanese American Confinement Size Consortium, we're united in 
opposition to this proposal, which would desecrate sacred land. We're very interested in developing partnerships with the broader AAPI community. We believe that this is an affront to the AAPI community. And we're grateful for the leadership of preservation and conservation partners, particularly the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I'd like to acknowledge the great work of Betsy Merritt with the trust and her colleague, Christopher Cody, for providing um, excellent public comments for NEPA. We're also grateful to support from NPCA and many other organizations. So in terms of how you can help um, section 106, looking for consulting parties to engage with BLM, we plan to um, share a sign-on letter for organizations to sign on. Uh, the, the more the better. Uh, we plan to do that in the next few weeks. We're also looking to uh, call attention to this project in the media. Um, and we're also looking for any experts, any people that have experts with the utility industry, uh, transmission and um, wind generation. For more information, um, please feel free to contact me or the Friends of Minidoka. I'm an advisor to the Friends of Minidoka, as well as the Minidoka Pilgrimage Committee. Uh, their contact information is there and uh, will be put in the chat. So if folks have any questions, I would strongly encourage you to reach out. We desperately need help to fight this effort. Thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to answering questions during the Q&A period. Thanks, Dan. A lot of really helpful information there of how folks can help. Uh, uh, next, uh, we have Ed. Thanks Ed. so much, Michelle. And thank you to APIA HIP and to the National Trust for Historic Preservation for this opportunity to be part of the Pass Forward Conference. And I just wanna to say to all my panelists, it is an honor to be presenting alongside all of you and the important work that you're doing. Uh, I am going to be talking about the Angel Island Immigration Station. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Angel Island, uh, what I do want to share is that Angel Island sits on the ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok Indians. And from 1910 to 1940, over 500,000 immigrants were either processed or detained through Angel Island. These immigrants came from 80 different countries, but the majority of them were Asian Pacific Islander because of the exclusionary immigration policies that started with the Page Act of 1875 that continued with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and many other immigration policies over the next decades that ultimately created this zone where if you came from an Asian Pacific Islander country, uh, if you were a laborer, more often than not, you could not enter the US. And even if you were in the US, you could not become a U.S. citizen. So what you see on the screen here are just a couple of examples of the historical images that detail what happened to the immigrants at Angel Island. While most of us might be familiar with the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island, and definitely there was detention and exclusion that happened there at a smaller scale, today the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island stand as a symbol of our country's welcoming of immigrants. Angel Island has sometimes been called the Ellis Island of the West or the West Coast Ellis Island, but the reality is what Angel Island reminds of us, us of is a darker chapter in US history that focuses on the exclusion of specific groups and the detention of specific groups. That detention and immigration process at Angel Island was very different if you were an Asian immigrant compared to a European immigrant. Asian immigrants were forced to undergo much more intensive and invasive medical screenings where they had to strip completely naked. The detention lasted anywhere from three weeks to three months, all the way on up to two years for Asian immigrants, whereas for European immigrants, that detention was typically just a matter of days. And then the Board of Special Inquiry Processes, or in other words, the interrogations of Asian immigrants was much more detailed. Uh, and in particular for Chinese immigrants, they were asked question upon question, hundreds of questions trying to verify their identity. Angel Island uh, today is actually a story of preservation and advocacy in that in the early 1970s, there were plans to tear down all the buildings and turn them into picnic grounds and campsites. But luckily, thanks to community organizing, we were able to save those buildings. And what you see on this picture uh, is what the site looks like today. So I definitely invite you to come and visit Angel Island 
in person because there's nothing like experiencing history where it happened. Or if you're not able to make it out to the Bay Area, then uh, to check out our website, www.aiisf.org, where we have a couple of virtual tours that we've created. The big challenge for us has been ferry service. So as you see from the screen, uh, the Angel Island is smack dab in the middle of San Francisco Bay. There's one ferry service from San Francisco and one ferry service from Tiburon, a town north of San Francisco. And last year, the company that operates the San Francisco ferry service announced that they were going to be stopping service, which meant that there would no longer be direct service from San Francisco to Angel Island. Now, can you picture living in New York City or visiting New York City and not having ferry service from New York City to the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. That's the equivalent of the, the situation that we faced at Angel Island. And so we decided that it was important for us to take a stand and to activate the community. And what you see on the screen is really similar to what you've heard from some of the previous speakers in terms of some of the different strategies that we use from exploring legal representation to social media and media awareness campaigns to reaching out to various policymakers, including uh, various representatives, as well as San Francisco City Council. Uh, as well as mobilizing a community sign-on process. And thanks to many of you who are actually watching today and your organizations, we were able to secure over seven news reports, an organizational letter with 32 sign-ons, and over 375 public comments, all of them protesting the potential stopping of ferry service from San Francisco. So I'm glad to share that uh, that process has led to a success where there's been another company that has agreed to come on to provide ferry service continued uh, from San Francisco to Angel Island. Uh, and they are still in the process of negotiations, but what we've learned uh, actually just earlier this week is that they are holding a public hearing this coming Friday where they are going to take public comments on some proposed fare increases. And you see those increases on the left-hand side of the screen. Currently, if an adult fare is 19.50 round trip and they're proposing to raise, to raise that to, to $31. For youth and seniors and people living with disabilities, the fare is have currently $11 and they are proposing to raise that to $17. Uh, and so um, what we're asking all of you is to help send an email to public hearing at goldengate.org by 4.30 p.m. Pacific this coming Friday, uh, and to share your thoughts on these fare increases. From our vantage point, we appreciate Golden Gate Ferry District coming in and, and making sure that there's still direct ferry service. There's actually a reduced fare for local visitors if you're using a commuter card. However, the fares for adults and children who are not using a commuter card, we're concerned that it will potentially make it harder for, for visitors um, to pay this higher fee. So again, the, the email is there. And if you want to learn more about Angel Island or other ways to get involved, feel free to, to connect with us on any of our social media links. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ed. So we have just a few minutes left. Um, and I wanted to um, open it up for folks who may have some questions um, for our speakers or for if our speakers have questions for each other as well, you can do that. Um, you can either put it in the chat or you can raise your, your hand and I can, um, we can unmute you if you have a question for one of our speakers. And I know that there's some questions directly um, in the chat. Um, I know what I see right now for, for Ed about the ferry service. Um, and I, just as, as people are putting in their questions, um, I know for the ferry service issue, you know, something that uh, API Hippen that I've brought up to, uh, to San Francisco's planning department, uh, I was asked to talk about justice and equity um, in, in planning as the San Francisco planning department had uh, laid out their re equity resolution. And one of the case studies that I brought to their own attention, ironically, was about this ferry service issue and that it's not just a historic preservation issue, right? It's about access um, and, you know, that planners in San Francisco, particularly transportation planners and planners who, are, you know, support like access to green spaces um, and recreation and not just history and, and also as arts and culture, 
to make those connections um, in the types of planning that they do in San Francisco and, and how we how we do this, right? Like preservation is not in this like um, silo that it doesn't exist and doesn't interact with other forms of planning um, and policy. And so hopefully today um, you got a little taste of how advocacy looks, what advocacy looks like in historic preservation, right? Some of them are direct asks, going to members of Congress, which is really important. Others is providing public comment, um, donating, liking, um, our social media pages, right? Um, forwarding that along. Um, and so, yes, um, there, you know, so these are some ways, and I don't know if I don't see any questions um, on here. Uh, I have a question I see here from Evelyn Hang Yin for Dan. How do you garner interest and in, uh, energy from communities for a site that's far away um, from many of the urban areas um, from places like Minidoka, Idaho? Uh, very good question. They are far, Minidoka is far away from the where survivors and descendants live, primarily Oregon, Washington, Alaska, California, and Hawaii. Um, this is something that we as descendants and survivors feel very strongly about. People are incredibly motivated. This, as I said before, it is sacred ground for us. We did not ask to be put in a prison camp. Our families in the middle of Southern Idaho, but we were there and this is our place to heal and to deal with the pain and the trauma of losing everything. So this is something that, um, and Mia as former executive director of Friends of Minidoka can I'm sure can attest to this. This is something that we are gonna fight till the last breath. Um, let's see what other questions. Um, I know Barbara White had put a comment. There is a book, um, the National Park Service released a theme study, um, AAPI theme study in 2017. And there was a small distribution of the printed book. Um, I'm trying to drop in the hyperlink um, for the PDF versions of the chapters. But if you would like a copy, a printed copy, which is a rare find, uh, email Barbara. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Um, are there any recommended methodologies one em could employ to get Asian American preservation initiatives in their own area or on a local basis? I don't know if any of the speakers would like to jump onto that question. I don't know, Tej Paul, I see you kind of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, one thing I'd say is like, I, I don't know if this even qualifies as like a, a official methodology, but like, you know, just con I'd say connect with the local community, right? Because Typically, from what I've seen and from my experience, the local community is doing something. Um, we're just, we just may not be aware of it because we're sitting in our ivory towers miles away. Um, so first things first, connect with the local community, see if there are already initiatives that are going on or if there are community leaders or sometimes it's just one individual or you know two individuals. For example, in Berkeley, we have this is an amazing South Asian um, radical history walking tour in Berkeley. And that's done by two individuals who, you know, take some time out of their day job on the weekends and do this walking tour. Um, and it's, you know, something that you can look over if you're not aware. So just recommend the first thing you do is just, you know, rather than coming in as an outsider and trying to, you know, launch this initiative, see if there's something else already happening and at the local level that you can just assist with. Thanks, Ted Paul. Um, any other folks want to respond? And I think, so uh, one of the things I, in the, I think it was on the session um, and the, for women's um, and preservation, one of the things that I dropped in the chat was, um, you know, thinking about even solidarity work and allyship um, and supporting each other kind of as, what Tej Paul is saying is a, a lot of work is being done. Um, and so um, it's, it's really just elevating the work that folks are doing. Um, and it may not take on traditional preservation forms, right? Uh, for many Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities, it's not done in traditional preservation forms, right? Um, so there are some folks who are experts at section 106 and there's others who will never touch Section 106, but they see their work um, 
in different ways, in different practices, right? Um, and so, and as Tejpal mentioned, the Berkeley uh, South Asian Radical Walking Tour, History Walking Tour, um, you know, is just one of those examples that we've um, tried to elevate through API HIP. Um, API HIP is a national organization where a volunteer run, um, but the, the what we do is we bring together um, in our networks, folks like who you see here today, who are experts in different fields, who call, we call out upon each other as Dan had, right? Like we need technicians, we need folks who understand like the energy work, you know, industry. We need folks who can write the technical reports, right? Um, and so I, we're often at API HIP, um, not only asked to write letters of support or letters of opposition, but also to provide just, we don't do the, the full technical assistance, but you know, it's like, here's the issue, how can we connect you, right? And we do these call outs to support each other as a community, um, at, you know, understanding these differences and, but where, you know, it's, it's a practice of solidarity work that we do within our Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities um, and then across other uh, minoritized and marginalized groups. Um, and so, you know, and even within advocating, uh, we often get asked, oh, can, you know, can we have a focus group on Asian Americans, right? And it's us pushing back and saying, well, you should have a group, a focus group on Asian Americans and then another one on indigenous folks who are, who identify as Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, right? So, and not to, to bring us all, you know, to clump us all together, say like have five representatives speak on the entire spectrum of experiences of Asian Americans and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, but rather for us to push back as Tej Paul mentioned in his talk of, you know, um, to hit, uh, to address issues of parity and equity, um, to really push not just a, for a 5% allocation or a 10% allocation, but to really address issues of equity with greater um, percentages um, of allocation of funding and, and um, priorities. Um, and so I have three minutes and if there's one more question folks may have, and, or else I'm gonna share my screen <laughs> on um, what should I call it? Sorry, I lost my screen. Um, Actually, there was a quick ahead. question yeah. from uh, Tom Cassidy highlighting regarding the Japanese American Memorial in Washington, DC. It's located at the base of the United States Capitol. It's an incredible um, memorial. If folks do get a chance, have some time to visit while you're doing your, if you have some downtime on your lobby day, uh, it's right there on the Senate side. So I encourage folks to visit. Yes. And um, with two minutes left, I wanted to, one, you guys are the first ones to officially see our Save the Date for API HIP. Um, we've been hosting every two years our National Historic Preservation Forum. You just, we often just refer to it as the forum because it's so long. Um, but our next one, um, fingers crossed, our last one was 2020 in the end of January, right before COVID and we had it in Honolulu. So for those who got to go, we were really lucky um, to <laughs> travel one last time. Um, but we are coming back, hopefully in person, fingers crossed. And we are hoping to, to see folks uh, join us um, in Lowell, Massachusetts. And you may be wondering where is Lowell and why Lowell? Uh, Lowell's just outside of Boston. So it's in the New England area. Um, and uh, we are looking at highlighting Southeast Asian um, history, uh, particularly as the 50th anniversary of the fall of Saigon and the Khmer Rouge and other uh, communist acts in Southeast Asia um, and the uh, resettlement of refugees uh, from Southeast Asia into the United States um, is coming up. And so we wanted to, you know, the 50 year rule is coming up uh, for them. And so we wanna really support the wonderful work that's happening um, in Lowell, Massachusetts, if you've not been, um, it's a very interesting kind of even built environment, um, the landscape of early American history with the juxtaposition of a lot of Southeast Asian and a Asian signage. Um, and so we want to invite folks to come join us July 22nd to July 24th um, in Lowell, Massachusetts. And because of COVID restrictions, of course, we are going to provide uh, virtual opportunities uh, for attendees, um, including hopefully people can jump on the virtual tours. Um, and then one last thing is, um, 
a quick plug again for API HIP. Uh, you can visit us on our website, apihip.org. We're also on Facebook. And, uh, we have a, a newsletter that comes out at least once a month, uh, which includes um, calls for action, so advocacy, um, upcoming events, and grants and other kinds of opportunities. And if there's anything you would like to share, you can email us, um, and we can hopefully put it onto our newsletters. Um, so you can email it to us here um, with the information. And um, let me double check. And I think we have hit exactly at time. So I wanna thank our speakers um, for sharing a little bit about the amazing advocacy work you do um, in preserving and telling our stories as Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. I see so many of our good friends joining us today um, I, it's wonderful to see so many names. Um, and so thank you. And uh, we'll see you um, next year, hopefully at the forum and at Pass Forward. Um, let us know anything that we can um, help you out with here at API HIP and enjoy the rest of Pass Forward, everyone.